One of those passages of scripture I feel like already preaches itself. I counted about four or five different ways somebody can be offended by that, that chapter. And uh, without even any, anybody saying anything, just reading that chapter. And then I got to thinking, you know, probably about 90% of the Bible, if you just read it, it probably offends somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the 10 percent that everybody wants to preach they don't offend anybody and so uh but you know i'm not going to preach anything offensive tonight but i'm just saying <laughs> look at james chapter one james chapter one we're picking up where we left off last week in ministering to the elderly which seems you look around a little bit you think well how does this even apply to us well i don't know number one number two it could one day Right. <laughs> number number three, uh, the Bible talks about it, and so if the Bible talks about it, you know it's something worth discussing. Look at James, Hebrews, James, chapter one, verse twenty-seven. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this: to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. A lot of people say, oh, well, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And I'm thinking, religion is not a bad word, right? right religion is something, it's a, it has to do with our belief system and what we believe and what we do. And the Bible says this, I don't, it doesn't matter what you be believe, I mean, it does matter what you believe, but what is important and what's effective and gets the work done is what you do. Amen. And the Bible says that we're to be ministers. Ministers means we're actually giving of ourselves to help somebody else. So the work of the ministry, preaching the gospel for sure. That's that's the important ministry. We want to see people saved. Amen. That's something we're doing. The best work that we can do for somebody. But then there's also ways in which we minister to others in uh, in giving to them and helping them, being there for their needs. And one of the things the Bible mentions a lot are poor people, and often it links that in with widows and fatherless. And these talking about you can just now obviously our time times are different and uh, widows it's easier for them to receive care now than it was in those days it's easier for poor people to get assistance now from government and different places than it was in those days but the Bible says that we're supposed to be caring and giving to people in their needs as Christians and so last week we started a series and we're gonna have one more Lord willing to finish it out, but a series on ministering to the elderly. And I pointed out last week how it seems like the elderly is a, a people group, I guess if you could say, that our society seems to want to get rid of. And it's almost like, hey, they're not that important. They've already had their time. Now let's get them off the scene and let's take over. And we'll do church the way young people want to do church and forget about how the old people want to uh, worship God or what they did to start this church or all the, the history behind all that they've done. And it just seems like they get pushed aside. And so I think it's appropriate. And if you, you guys have been out there uh, to the work in Iola, so you understand uh, I had to really make a huge jump going from ministering to youth. I was a youth pastor. Basically, it was my title, assistant pastor and youth pastor, and dealing with the young people. And then I had to switch from that and go in to primarily people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s. And that's who I'm ministering to, a big jump. And I had to learn that because I've been a teenager before, but I've never been 60. You know, sometimes I feel like it, but I've never really gone through that. So I have to deal with people. And so I've, in a, in a, in a way, not necessarily doing a, a literal study, but in a way I've been studying older people and I've been trying to figure out how I can better reach them and take care of them because I certainly love our people there in Iola and I would never do like that Methodist church did I talked about last week where they uh, kick, p kicked all the older folks out of the church for 18 months so they can redo their service with the young people and, and figure out how to get things growing and popping for Jesus, right? And so that makes me mad. So last week we talked about door knocking and, and, and visiting them on during soul winning. Uh, probably everybody in here at one point has knocked on a door and had somebody who we would consider elderly answer the door. Typically when I say elderly, I'm talking about more disabled because of their age. I mean, some people in their 70s that, you know, 
They, they seem almost as young as I am <laughs> physically, but, but typically we're talking about people who are really in need of assistance, okay? And so today we're going to start on this idea of visiting shut-ins, visiting shut-ins. That's what we call them. Uh, I don't think that's an offensive term or anything. Just people that are shut in their house. They can't get out is the main idea that we're talking about. And the Bible says, like we just read in James, pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And I don't think that we should just neglect our older folks in the church. And I'll we'll talk about that tonight. So number one, let's look at a few different people that fit into this category of shut-ins. Number one would be those that live in, they live at home, but they just can't get out, okay? And, then, and there would be several ways in which this uh, would take place. We've got, an old, we've got a couple that have been members for many years, but they're both in wheelchairs and their health is so bad that, I mean, they can hardly get out of the house at all. And so they, they've not, they hardly ever come to the church, but we try to keep them visited, keep them in the know of what's going on at the church and try to uh, somehow feed them spiritually. All right, and it's a little bit of a chore. But those that can't get out, and here's what I've noticed. If you look at all the cases of those who don't ever come to church or hardly ever come to church because of their age, the truth of the matter is they probably could technically get out. They probably could technically, in fact, if in, when they absolutely have to, guess what? They'll end up going to Walmart to get groceries or something like that, okay? And so the actuality is they could come to church, but there's a lot of hindrances. It's very, very difficult for them, okay? One reason is it takes them a long time to get ready, and they may, ne may need assistance to even get ready. And if nobody's at home to provide that form, uh, you know, if you've ever watched... Somebody in their 80s, uh, you know, f that's physically handicapped, even try to put on a pair of socks or something like that. And that's a chore, and it takes a long time. Sometimes they got to get up really early to be able to make it to church in time. Which I think is funny because a lot of these churches that are trying to figure out a way to bridge the gap and bring in the young people and kind of out with the old and in with the new, is they've decided to go to two services. You ever seen churches with two services? And what they do is they say, okay, we'll put the the traditional service where all the old people go and we'll do that early morning that's the first service that we'll do right and then we'll do in the kind of getting towards the afternoon then we'll do the more contemporary service where all the young people could come and i remember thinking well that makes sense because you know, a lot of the young people are lazy and they don't want to get up early and take some more you know all right i can get out of bed and go to church in the afternoon and I thought, actually, and so the, so the older people are more likely to be there on time for the morning service. But actually, man, it's going to take them a long time to get ready, and it's, it's harder for them to get there in the morning. I remember thinking, you know how the old people sometimes go to McDonald's and drink their coffee? And I remember thinking, hey, we got a lot of old people in our church. I'll have a, a night, I mean, a, a morning once a month where we'll go meet the old people. Nine o'clock, McDonald's. We'll meet there, have some coffee, and we'll talk things through. And I realized one of our guys was like, man, uh, first I was going to do 8 o'clock. And, and I thought, hey, old people get up early. And he's like, yeah, that takes me a long time to get around. <laughs> After he gets up and goes through his morning rituals and does all this. I don't mean rituals like spiritual. <laughs> but, you know, just the things that they have to do to get started. And, uh, and it, it takes them a long time. So anyway, uh, sometimes it takes them a lot of time. Other times, B, they often need transportation. We have a lady, she's 92, man, she's sharp as a tack, precious lady, uh, gets around really well, but she just not too long ago decided she needs to stop driving. And I, let's be honest, you've seen people out there that need to stop driving, right? <laughs> they're, they're beyond that time where they shouldn't be driving anymore. But man, that's a hard to tell a, a, an older person that they can't drive anymore. But this lady realized, hey, the, my time has come. I need to stop driving. And so she needs to get assistance. And, and thankfully, I'm getting ahead of myself, but thankfully she's got family that don't go to our church, but they will go to her house early in the morning, take her to church, then they'll go to their services, get out of their services, come to our church, pick her up and take her home. You know, the family's uh, is taking care of their mother. And so, but sometimes they do need transportation and then they can come to church. Talking about our shut-ins now, okay? Number two, here's the reason some don't come. The building may not be convenient for their needs. 
And some literally think every time, like, is it worth going to church today? I'm going to have to endure this. I'm going to have to, you know, I'm not going to have this. Uh, uh, I don't want to say luxury, but some of these things we would think, you know, we, we, we don't think are a big deal. But one of the things would be like, how about the handicap accessible ramps? One of our guys actually had to build a, a permanent ramp, well, a more permanent anyway, ramp to get in there because anytime we had somebody with a walker or a wheelchair, that little step to get into the church, you'd be surprised how difficult that is for some of our older folks to even go. So that's the first ha hassle they have right at the door. Number two, handicap accessible bathrooms. Anybody try to use our bathrooms there in Iola? <laughs> Those are, it's kind of hard. If you're, if you're a big guy, it's hard to get in some of those stalls. <laughs> Certainly can't get a wheelchair in there. And so we've actually had some people that say, well, I got to go to the bathroom a lot and I'm not going to be able to get into uh, to the bathroom. So we're actually thinking about trying to figure out a way to make those bathrooms handicap accessible. Han uh, handicap accessible bathrooms, handicap accessible seating. If you walk into our church, one of the first things you might notice, lazy boys in the back of the chair. La lazy boy Baptist church, man, that's a, that's a good impression on the visitors. <laughs> but you know why we put those there is because there are people that I'm not going to be able to sit in those pews through a service. You don't understand my back problems and all that. And uh, we said, well, what, what are you comfortable sitting in? Let's put those in the back of the church and you can come. And, and so it was a little awkward for some, but some would come to a service uh, that wouldn't have physically been able to sit through the service on the pew, but they sit back there in the, uh, like they might fall asleep and start snoring, but hey, they came to church. <laughs> to church. <laughs> so anyway, sometimes there are these things that will make it where they can't come, you know, and, and, and don't be overly critical of that because you've never been that age and you've never had that kind of pain and, 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 and know how difficult it is to get in, into a service, okay? So, when you th start thinking about this, and this is going to be true really for, for all these different categories, but when you start thinking about this, you can see how having somebody in the church who's an assistant pastor or a deacon uh, can oversee this aspect of ministry, all right? And that's biblical. Look at Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. It is something that is an important ministry that needs to be done. And you can see where it would be helpful to get some people, because it's important, but, you know, if you start giving all your time to this stuff, you would start not being able to do some of the more important things, right? And so here's what it, we see in Acts chapter 6. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve came, uh, called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now they weren't being arrogant and conceited, thinking, Hey, I'm too good to serve tables. You know, Jesus taught these guys how to be servants. They know how to be servants. But what they're saying is, Look, other people can take on this job. We've got some other things that we need to do that those people can't quite can't quite do. And so he said in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Always the qualification for those who are going to be in the ministry, you know. Uh, not just anybody just get up there and do it, but these are Holy Ghosts filled with wisdom. We even see uh, in, Gen uh, in Exodus when Moses is doing very ba basically the same thing here. It says, those who hate covetousness. Uh, that's interesting, I thought, but he's saying, hey, we want people that are committed and, they, and they'll put the Lord first and they're not going to go after the things of this world. And so here's the, basically where we see the first mention of, although the, name, the word deacons isn't used in this text, we see this principle. Okay, and later on when it talks about deacons, I think it's talking about these types of guys, okay? Filled with the Holy Ghost of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. There are lots of different ways in which the ministry of the Word uh, uh, takes place. Uh, but this saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip. And of course, we see these guys were preachers, and they went out into Samaria and all, elsewhere and preached the gospel. It mentions these other guys. I'll mess up their names if I try to say them. All right, so, uh, so we see... 
th that there's a great benefit of a church getting to the point where they have somebody they can assign over that ministry. Okay, and, and actually their whole job is to make sure these people have these needs met. They get transportation. They get, uh, you know, all these things taken care of. Look at number two here. Uh, those blanks were pastor and deacon if you didn't put that, that down. Number two under, under this uh, section, families should be involved with assisting the elderly. Families should be involved. If you go back to uh, our text that was read there, 1 Timothy 5, <clears throat> this had a lot to say about uh, the way that we're supposed to treat the widows, particularly that are in the church. And, and I won't get into a whole lot of that, but look at uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter Chapter 5, I think it says 4 in your notes. It's actually 5, sorry. Chapter 5, look at verse 4. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents. For that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplication and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give I charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So you see, he's saying that, look, you have a responsibility. Like these people shouldn't just be destitute. And then their kids and their nephews and all those who could take care of them are just out doing whatever they want to do, enjoying life and all that, you know. Uh, now, look, again, I mentioned this last week. Now, God has called us and given us a mission. Remember, Jesus said, hey, some, to, to his disciples, he said, you're going to have to love me more than all these things. In fact, he, said, he uses this word. He says, any man that followed me and hate, hates not his mother and his father and, and all these people. Sorry for messing that up. But he said, if you don't, if you don't hate these things, you can't be my disciple. And that doesn't mean you got to hate your family members that, that wouldn't be scriptural you know in the sense that we think of hate but he's saying look compared to christ right he's who we're following first and if i have to i can I, i'm willing to despise my family members i'm willing to neglect them and go the opposite way from them if i have to in order to serve the lord but that doesn't mean that i don't have a responsibility to take care of them and so uh and so what he's saying though and, he, and i believe here you know, there are some that maybe even have to step it up a little bit more because of their position, the pastor and the, and the deacons and all that. They probably can't spend their whole time taking care of their, their family members. But look, even Jesus, his mother was apparently with him all the way up into the cross. And then he said to John, he said, here, take, this is, take care of my mother. You're, you, you know, she's going to be your mother now. You're going to take care of her. And so, uh, and so there, it's, we see this responsibility families have of taking care of that. Now, I say that because of this. A lot of times churches, the older folks that come to the church, their families are nowhere to be seen. <laughs> Somebody puts their uh, parents into the nursing home, and then it's like they never come visit. Right? And it's very, very unfortunate. But see, in the ministry, I think when we're ministering to them, there are several different reasons we need to try to get the family on board. And we need to get the family involved and find out from them uh, what's going on and what decisions are being made and all that. So families should be involved with assisting the elderly. That's biblical. Uh, not only is it biblical, but it just helps so that the church doesn't have to just constantly provide all these things. The family uh, takes, takes care of that need first and foremost. But it also uh, is good to be in close communication with the family because the family should know all the needs of the of that person you know they should know what they're going through they should know their health problems if the person starts getting some signs of alzheimer's or something like that isn't it kind of nice to know hey you better watch out for this person you know uh and 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 you might know need to know a few things about them okay also it's possible that unbelieving or unchurched your next blank there or unchurched family members can be reached through this process so in the process of us ministering to our elderly folks in the church, we have a possibility, an opportunity to also reach their family members. And they usually have a lot of family members. 
I mean, just ask them and they'll start listing out. We just talked to a lady the other day in the, in the neighborhood right there by the church. She's 86 years old and she's been living at that house. She's been alone for quite a while and she kept apologizing. She would tell us all about her life. And then she'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I don't usually talk about myself like this. I'm so embarrassed by just a blah, blah, blah about myself. And she's like, but I'm just, you know, I guess because I'm just here out by myself all the time. And then next thing you know, she's, we're going right back into it. And she's telling us all about her family members and where they live and what they're doing and my, how many grandkids I have. Knows them all by name. Probably thinks about them all the time, right? So what a great opportunity. That's like a bunch of contacts. We can start, you know, reaching out to them. Not to mention, they see, hey, that church is taking care of grandma, right? That's a, good, uh, that's a good relationship right there. So anyway, you never know how the Lord could bless that. We often think of it from the superficial, like, hey, this is inconvenient. I don't want to mess with these folks. You know, I'm all, I want a young, thriving church or whatever. Well, man, just let God work things out. He's put the people in the church that he wants to be there, and he will create opportunities uh, if he sees fit for you to kind of enlarge your coast, as it were. All right, so uh, B, not only when we're talking about shut-ins, not only is that, that talk about uh, those who can't get out of the house, but then those who are in the hospital, maybe just temporarily they're in the hospital getting some treatment, uh, that happens a lot. Okay, we got a lot of hospital visits. Some pastors and deacons, this is like the primary, primary part of their ministry. I've talked to a lot of pastors where they're like, oh, I'll make hospital calls, you know, uh, just all week long making hospital calls. And I think, man, you need to get you a deacon to go do that because, <laughs> I mean, it's great. And people want to see their pastor and all that. But, man, there's, there's a lot of other things that need to be accomplished but, uh, but there are some people, this is a huge part of their ministry. Now, let me say this. I am not a fan in any way of our health care system. Okay? I can't really think of much about our health care system. That I, I'm not saying other countries have better health care. I'm just saying I don't like our health care system. All right? uh, I don't like, look at these, these here. I don't like the insurance racket. I don't. I think it's a racket, man. I think they. Uh, I mean, have you ever walked into a hospital? I do it all the time when I go to visit somebody in the hospital, and I'm looking around at all the fancy chandeliers, and the fancy decorations, and they're constantly remodeling, building a bigger building. And I'm thinking, I understand like wanting to be confident with the place and and have it look nice whenever you go in there to 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 get your health care. But I'm thinking, where do you think all that money came from? <laughs> All that money in the hospitals came from the bills that they charge, and the, char and the charges are ridiculous because the whole insurance, uh, uh, what I think is a racket, okay? And I don't like that, and let me tell you, they take advantage of old people. Old people have insurance. They have Medicaid. They have Medicare. I don't know the difference between the two. They have all these different insurance. Some of them have been saving insurance all their life because they're preparing for a rainy day because that's what they were always taught to do. We got somebody, some people have uh, uh, nursing home insurance, right? So that whenever they go into nursing home, hey, I've been paying on that for so many years so that I don't have to burden my family with that. And a lot of older folks are thinking that way and they're being prepared. But guess what? All of those doctors know, hey, this person's, we don't have to worry about them. They're going to pay their bill. And so they got them in there. Hey, well, let's just stay for another weekend. Let's just come back next week and, 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 and do this other procedure on you. Let me give you this medicine and that medicine. And you go and they'll have this whole cabinet just full. Anybody ever seen that? And nowadays, some people in their 20s and 30s have that same thing. You go on their countertop, they got like a, just this, all these medications. And you're thinking, there's no way. I don't care how, how well studied somebody is on medicine. There's no way that somebody knows what all those medications can do to somebody's mind <laughs> mixed up and all this stuff uh you know it, it is it's ridiculous uh we were helping somebody um actually they had just passed away we were moving some stuff out of their house and uh, uh i didn't know the guy but his cabinet was just full of medicine and i'm thinking i mean i just can't imagine what that could do to somebody's somebody's body and in, in their mind you know but insurance, I believe, is a racket. I already talked about the over-medication of patients. It's ridiculous. They give you medicine on something, and then if, that medicine, if there's some side effects from that medicine, they'll give you another medicine to combat those side effects, which will cause another problem. They'll say, huh, I don't know why your kidneys aren't working. Let me give you this other medicine to take care, to alleviate some of that pain. And it's just like, ugh, 
how does people how do people not realize I'm not a I'm not a uh, you know I, I don't have a medical degree but I can look at that and say that that system's broken that's messed up right here's the other thing they do and this is I think related to hey the insurance is gonna pay so we can do it surgeries when they're not needed just constantly oh we'll just cut that out you know you don't need that I guess they think evolution you know that's vestigial it doesn't make it, you don't need that anyway we just cut it out of there yeah we just uh, I don't know how many people in our church you know they said oh well we better take out that uh, what what was the latest we'll take that gallbladder out I think I think the problem is that gallbladder and they remove that gallbladder and then a couple of the, it didn't fix the problem so they said oh actually it's something else meanwhile we took your gallbladder out <laughs> right? And then there are all kind of infections and stuff in there. And then it's just like, just constantly. I told my wife, I said, I got a few things in me that probably need, need surgery, man. I got a hernia that I've had since I was like 20. I got a, like a bump on the head that's a little bit curious. And I'm thinking, oh, man, it's a tumor, man. I need to get that. Ready. And I'm like, don't let anyone start cutting on me, man. Because as soon as they start cutting, unless it's an absolute emergency, right? As soon as they start cutting, it's just like one thing leads to another. But anyway, I just said all that to say I, I, I'm not big on the whole medical field and uh, this whole system, the healthcare uh, system that we got there. But when I go visit an older, fo an older person in the hospital or an older person in the church starts talking about, I'm on all these medications and I got this appointment, you know, that I got to go to. You know what? I, I do not. That's not my t that's not my opportunity to start to, to choose a battle, you know, and start telling them how much I hate the healthcare system or how much they shouldn't be on those medications or whatever. That's not the time. OK, uh, as a pastor, I primarily leave these decisions up to the individual and their family. Right now, hopefully we can make talk some sense into some people and they can realize how silly some of that is. Uh, but for the most part, I am just there to make a visit to be there to provide some support. My main concern is their spiritual need, okay? Here's some reasons we make hospital visits. Number one, we're visiting them to show brotherly love. Brotherly love. We already talked about in our text there, 1 Timothy talks about treating the elderly as your father, uh, the elder as your fathers, right? Treating the younger ladies as your sister and treating the younger men as your brother, men. And, uh, and we understand that's how church is. Church is like a family. I can't understand people that don't have a church home. I don't understand, like, like why wouldn't you want to be part of that? Yep. Is your family just that great uh, without Christ that you're like, hey, this is my family, right? I guarantee you it's not. And so we need a church family. I'm not saying that your physical blood, flesh and blood family isn't important. It is. But, but really, God's provided all that in the church. Amen. So, uh, so we don't want to, uh, what was I saying? Why was I saying that? Oh, okay, because we want to be there to show brotherly love. You know, somebody from the church ought to visit that folk, that person if they're in the hospital. You know, even if their other, if the rest of their family members are there, we should, we should be there. Now, I do also believe that we're there to offer any wisdom or counsel that we can, but only when asked. All right, and here's what I got down. We don't want to be like Job's friends. We don't want to be like Job's friends, just sitting around. Now, I will say this. I, when I studied that, that passage of scripture, one day it dawned on me that they did sit there for seven days and not say a word. <laughs> right? A lot of times we forget that. And we're like, oh, Job's friends, they just started offering all this counsel. They sat there for seven days and just watched him suffer. I don't know, what, I don't know why that, how that was a help, okay? But somehow <laughs> we're just going to go there and be support for him, just watch him suffer for seven days. We won't even say a word, okay? But then they, uh, but then they started trying to give all this counsel. Well, you know what the problem is. You know what the problem is. Usually people that are in pain uh, and have all kinds of problems, they're not really, they don't really care. <laughs> you know, what the initial reason is or something. They're just suffering, and they want somebody to be there because they love them and they're their family. And so uh, they're there to visit them in the hospital. That's why we do that. All right, and then here's another person that we would call a uh, shut-in. That would be somebody who is in a nursing home or assisted living. And... Uh, To these people, you know, in many ways, the things that we just covered about hospitals applies to these nursing homes or this assisted living. Usually by the time they're in a nursing home, it's because they have great need 
to, for somebody to provide care for them and their family just can't do it or whatever. Now, again, the family needs to be involved. We need to try to f make sure the family knows what's going on and they're communicating with you and, and you're talking with the family as much as possible. But really those people, they just want a visit. They want to know somebody cares, you know, and a little bit of time they have left on earth or whatever, they want to uh, uh, just know that there's still people out there that care for them. So let me just uh, say a few things here about what we have as a nursing home ministry, okay? Nursing home ministry is not something that I would have just picked and said, hey, I know what I want to just go to the nursing home. Nursing homes creep me out. I'm just going to be honest with you. <laughs> when I was young and we'd go visit somebody in the nursing home, I didn't like the smell. I didn't like the people smiling at you, wheeling down. The, it was creepy, all right? And now that I got older, I'm getting used to it because I go to the nursing home all the time and we do a ministry there. But it's still creepy. We had this one lady that time I walked in and I'm just shaking hands and everything. And this lady, man, probably like 100 years old in her, in her wheelchair, she looks up and she says, you're cute. <laughs> I was like, well, thank you. I like this lady. She thinks I'm cute. And I kid you not, she's like, you want to sit on my lap? And I was like, okay, we need to get out of here. <laughs> Over hold my wife. This is my wife. Have you met her yet? But you just never know what's going to happen. And as a kid, and then even like when just getting into the ministry, I remember thinking, I don't want to do this ministry. This is a hard ministry. Who wants to do that, right? But as we've been going, meeting folks, realizing that, hey, you're being a blessing to some people. We've even had people join our church as a result of this ministry because maybe they were there for a small amount of time or maybe a family member or something like that, and they came. So here's, here's just a couple things on this. Number one, I only recommend someone pursue this as an evangelistic opportunity or if a church member has been placed in the nursing home, all right? So I don't necessarily think it's like the wisest thing to say, I know, we'll just go pick a nursing home. That's where we'll start our ministry, okay? However, the Lord directs, and people in your church family that might be older and they get put in there, instead of just forgetting about them and saying, well, that's the end of them, let's focus on what we got right here. No, let's look at this as an opportunity to be a blessing to that person, and who knows how God could use that to accomplish his work. And so uh, if, if you're using it as an evangelistic, there are people that get saved in nursing home ministries. Uh, some of the older folks that are there get saved for sure. Uh, a lot of them are still able to think and reason through the Bible, but there are some who have kind of lost their minds and really they're going to come and they're always going to tell you the same story and they're not getting anything that you say. That is definitely, uh, uh, there are some like that, but there are some that listen, but not just that. Uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but if you skip down to the bottom here, uh, E, it's a possible way of reaching family, and F, it's a possible way of reaching the workers, okay? Oftentimes, during the, uh, we have a scheduled time where we go every other Tuesday, I'm thinking about starting on the Tuesdays that we're not there, going out to Moran, because that's where Brother Webb is. And I think he'd really benefit from that uh, as well as, as, you know, who knows who we could reach in there, right? So you just take advantage of the opportunities God gives you, you know what I'm saying? But I wouldn't necessarily go out there and focus on starting that ministry. But if you have an opportunity to be, uh, to be a part of that and to preach there, it's, it's, it is a great opportunity. And a lot of times a family member will come visit them in the nursing home and then they'll say, oh, it's time for the Bible study, right? And then the parent, that, that family member will come and they'll sit with them. And we've met a lot of people who uh, were just there and they showed up to the nursing home ministry uh, a whole lot younger, right? And maybe able to comprehend things a little bit better. Uh, and, and you're able to preach the gospel and whatever. I have never had any feeling in the nursing home like they cared what I preached, right? Which is a little scary because I've seen pictures where Jehovah's Witnesses get in there and I see the same group of people in the other room while the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching them, right? So, so that's a little concerning, but at the same time, here's what that means. That means those workers in there are just happy to have a half hour or an hour or whatever where you're taking care of them and they can get a little break, right? And they don't really care what you have to say. And so you're free to preach the gospel. I've never felt hindered. I can say whatever I want. I know a lot of those guys, their background, maybe raised Nazarene or something like that. And I can just start talking about eternal security or I can talk about all these things. 
and uh, and I've never felt like I'm in, I'm going to get kicked out of there or something like that. But not only that, when I start talking about salvation, or uh, you know, preaching hard against a, a certain a certain thing that it might not seem to apply to the people I'm talking to, I see workers walking <laughs> walking around. And all the time, I'll, if I'm saying something, I'm like, man, these workers need to hear this. I'll kind of up the volume a little bit, right? And I know sometimes, and sometimes they're sitting there filling out paperwork or whatever, and I feel like they're trying to listen to what's being said, some of those workers there. So I just treat it as a, like a uh, open-air preaching ministry <laughs> sometimes. Like people are there, they're going to listen to me. I'm already scheduled to be here and to preach. So it can be a great opportunity. Okay, so anyway, I just want to put that out there that this uh, – uh, Part of going there is it is an open door to reach other people. But not only that, uh, now we have had some who, uh, like they're Catholic, and so their family like forbids them to, to go to the, <laughs> to the preaching services or something like that. And uh, you get those kinds of things sometimes. But we had, a, we had a, a lady in there that was 102. I think she just turned 102. Her name is Floyd. I mean, uh, yeah, Floyd. And... Uh, and we've had some of our older folks. Here's the other thing. We take people from our church who are in their 70s and 80s. And we go with, and they go with us to the nursing home. And they're sitting amongst people in their 70s and 80s. It just makes sense, right? And so they take them. And they're holding the song books open for them, finding the page, and, uh, and, and helping them do that. And then they're also talking to them. And one of our ladies went to this 102-year-old lady and said, well, do you know that you, if you died, if you go to heaven? She's like, I don't believe in that stuff. Can you imagine 102 years old? I mean, your time's coming just any day. Today we were talking to a, a lady, uh, a young lady, maybe in her 20s, and she said she didn't believe in the Bible and all that. Praise the Lord, I was able to give her the whole plan of salvation, and I really felt like a lot of liberty uh, to be able to give it to her. And at the very end, I felt like there was a little, there was something in her, you know, that little measure of faith God gives everybody, and she was kind of believing it, I think. And, she, and I said, uh, uh, do you think that's something that you could believe in, you could put your faith in? And she said, maybe someday, right? I understand a 20-year-old, and it's still, it's still not very wise, <laughs> but I understand a 20-year-old saying, hey, maybe one day I'll start seeking God, right? right. But 102 years old, you know, your time's probably, you know, coming to an end. And, uh, and old Floyd said, I'm not going to go there. And our older ladies would just go in there every time they would see her. I sure wish you would come. Sometimes she would start to come into the room, see people come and say, hey, something's going on in here. And then Valerie would start playing the piano. She'd be like, wait a minute. What's going on in here? It's a Bible study. She, as fast as you can run with a walker <laughs> at 102 years old, she'd run out of there. But, you know, the other day, one of the ladies uh, came and brought her hand in hand to the, and this was, this was just one of the ladies at the nursing home. This wasn't one of our ladies that we bring. And she brought her hand in hand, sat her down, was helping her with the songbook, and I saw the look on her face right as the piano started playing, and she's kind of like, well, what's going on here? And I was like, oh, we just lost her. And, uh, and next thing you know, though, she's reading along in the songs and going <laughs> like that. She stayed for the preaching, right? Now, she left right at the end of the preaching as fast as she could, but she stayed during the preaching, and I thought, who knows how God's using that, right? Who knows how God's using it? We just need to just trust God, invest in the people that he allows us to invest in, okay? Here's some things that the older folks like. Number one, a lot of, uh, they, particularly like, they particularly enjoy children and animals. Not to confuse one with the other, right? But they prefer, I mean, you never know. Nowadays, a lot of people prefer the animals over the children. In the nursing home, if we have somebody with a child walking by behind me while I'm preaching to them, I know I've lost them. They used to have a, a uh, like a daycare there. It was kind of weird, but they had a daycare and a nursing home in the same building. And every once in a while, the daycare, they'd walk down the hall to go on a walk outside or something. I don't know. And we would just have to stop. And I just let all the old people smile at the little kids as they walk by because they like kids. So if you can bring your kids in, if you've got a family, you bring kids into the nursing home, they absolutely love it. Right? Get your kids up there to sing. They just enjoy that. It's, it's just you're providing some entertainment for them, you know. And I know that that can be thought of as a bad thing. Uh, but these people have, uh, have not a whole lot to live for in the nursing home, all right. So it's just a way to be a blessing to them. 
They enjoy lots of singing and music. So here's what I do, just a suggestion in case I ever somebody ever wants the opportunity to preach and they come down and preach for me in the nursery home, I'll show you what I do. I usually have like a half sheet of paper of notes and that's it, okay? But here's what I'll do. I'll have it written out where we'll sing a song and you have to wait because somebody you gotta find the right page and people are sitting down helping them find the page if you got workers doing that or whatever. And we'll sing the song. Now the cool thing is we sing right out, we sing songs out of the hymnal. Most people, even if they're Methodist, if they have a background of Methodist, Nazarene, whatever, a lot of them know those same songs, all right, because they're just kind of like, uh, you know, hand, went hand in hand with the Bible in a way in every service, you know. They know, like, like uh, they memorize certain verses and they sing certain hymns and, and, and whatever. And so it's a blessing. A lot of them that don't even, they can't even read, their mind's not even working right, but as soon as you start singing a song, they're mouthing it and they're singing right along. And that's pretty cool. OK, and uh, and as you can see that it just changing their mood and everything. So here's what I'll do. We'll sing a song and then I'll kind of introduce what I'm preaching about. It's usually just a simple topic. OK, and uh, I'll say a few thoughts about that. And the so many songs in our songbook are so deep in doctrine and all that, that usually whatever I'm talking about. And the cool thing is, too, you can preach the same thing, you know, several times in a row, and they're not, they're not going to remember. <laughs> but, you, uh, uh, but you know, I'll read that little point, and I'll talk to them. And look, you're going to lose, you think kids, it's hard to keep their attention. Older folks, that way, too. It's hard to keep their attention. So, oh, what am I talking about? It's hard to keep y'all's attention. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, you, we will break, I'll break it up by reading this passage of Scripture explaining it or giving a point or whatever and then I'll say okay now let's read it let's look up the next song that we're going to sing and then they'll turn to a song we'll sing another song see how it kind of breaks up then we'll go back and uh, say the next little point you know when you're at a nursing home preaching your your job isn't to go there and like just get this great just impress everybody with your great the theology and your doctrine and all that look just read the Bible to them say a few points sing a song read some more Bible, say, you see what I'm saying? Because it's really just a blessing for them to be able to hear the songs and to hear the Bible uh, taught to them. You don't have to get real deep on that. But man, I just wanted to share that. And there's one more thing that we'll cover next week, Lord willing, and that is dealing with older folks who are in the services, okay? The faithful members that come in your service, the services and how to deal with them, and how to deal with some of the things that they do uh, while you're preaching who was there on Sunday, uh, and I kept saying, that sound is just killing me. And I think I, I was pretty sure I knew what it was, but I was like, Zachary, will you make sure the microphones are off? It wasn't that. It was somebody has, sat in the back, and they have this hearing uh, uh, device that helps the hearing. And they, they turn it up. I don't know. It's like a speaker. I don't know what it is, but all I know is it's ee Phones going off, right? Sometimes they'll answer them. Hello? And you got to just... What am I going to do? With the right, right? It's, it's entertaining, <laughs> right? But it's worth it, okay? And, and we, don't ever, we just want to, you know, here's, here's my goal with this whole thing. Instead of saying, like that Methodist church, hey, we just need to get rid of the old people so our young people can, will want to come and, and the church will grow. What I would rather do is just teach the young people how to love on the older folks Amen. and endure some of their tendencies and and just show them some affection and even learn from them right there's a lot of things you can learn from some of the older folks and uh and so i would rather just teach that and then we all dwell together like one big family okay which means we got to endure each other's faults right they got to endure some of our faults which one day we might come around and, and change our ways a little bit all right let's go to lord in prayer father thank you for uh your church we know you will build your church and so we leave it in your hands. We try not to lean on our own wisdom and our own thoughts, but we give, give it up uh, to you, give it over to you, Lord. We trust by faith that your word will not return void. And, and everything you promised in your, in your word is true. Help us just be faithful to it, Lord. Help, uh, help us be addicted to the ministry, Lord, as we go through uh, our lives here uh, on earth and accomplish what you'd have us to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.